Hello, 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 alô, olá, como estamos? <laughs> como estamos? It's Friday, viernes feliz, happy Friday, sextão, mais ou menos, né, gente? É... How are you feeling? How's everybody out there? How are we today? We're going live. And I hope you're joining us. That would be fantastic. I see a few comments coming in, a few more people coming in. Fantastic. Happy Friday. Happy Friday and welcome. Welcome to the last, the, okay, maybe not the last, but definitely the last session in our Black Women Disrupt Summer Series Live. Y'all, I'm feeling a little bit sad. I'm feeling a little bit teary-eyed. Um, we know that at the end of everything is also the beginning of other things. So it's just, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit in my feelings. Give me five seconds, I'll be all right. Welcome and thank you so much for tuning in. Please don't forget to tell us your name or you know send us a quick message. Let us know you're here. We're so excited. We're excited to be ending, but also excited to have our special guests here today. I'm excited because she's here. She's waiting backstage. I really just want to take a second though, um, Sister Disruptors, to just send you all our deepest thanks to let you know that you mean so much to us, that your support and your love and the ways that you guys are showing up for this program is just, it's really, um, it's beautiful and we appreciate you. Um, thank you so much for joining us live. Those of you, of you who've been here almost every week since June, um, a special shout out to those who join us on the replay, mainly because we know it's, it, our lives happen in the middle of the day. Sometimes you're working, you got stuff, you're homeschooling, you're doing all those things. You're doing the most, but you guys log in on a Saturday morning or you log in on Sunday and you make us feel like we are definitely together in community. I appreciate you. We appreciate you. Gracias por venir. Gracias por nos acompañar. Desde donde estén, um, ustedes han apoyado a nosotros desde el inicio de este seriado. Gracias, gracias por acompañarnos. Obrigada, hermanas, por nos acompañar todo este seriado desde junio. Tem sido uma experiência muito enriquecedor para todos nós. We see you, we thank you. And um, just letting you know that the session today is going to be in English. La sesión de hoy será en inglés, pero si tienes una pregunta en español, por favor, dejen su uh, mensaje en el chat para que nos podemos contestar sus preguntas, responder a sus preguntas. Si tem uma pergunta em português também, por favor, enviar no chat. Não esquece, a gente vai responder a cada um dos inquietudes de vocês. E hoje a sessão vai ser em inglês, mas por favor, junte-se a nós para uma conversa muito rica, tá bom? So, don't forget to leave a question for our special guest, Coquet Samueti, of Aman Lamobi, below. We'll get to your questions, we promise. It's going to be great, I promise. And so, you all know the deal. At Black Women Disrupt, we are connecting with sister disruptors in a new way in 2020, and we're in month eight of 2020, so you already know this. We're still committed to inspiring, to challenging and co-creating and transforming our societies. We're working with businesses and social enterprises led by Black women in the Americas and around the world. Um, we have, however, an even more important thing that we feel like we were compelled to do over this summer, and that was to curate more intimate conversations, bring the voices of sister disruptors straight to you over this past three months. Um, please click on our link in the notes, subscribe and stay tuned for upcoming opportunities to connect and grow together. We've been interested in exploring life after a pivot, learning lessons from sisters living this moment just like us um, all around the world. People who can help us reconnect to ourselves, to our brilliance, to our missions, and women who remind us that we still have a unique purpose in life and that the fight has not continued, the, the fight has not ended, the struggle is not over. 
that even if we are in the midst of some of the most challenging times, we can build, we can grow, and we will build again. There is so much more we can do and will do to support our families and our communities and transform the societies in which we live. We've been asked by friends and sister disruptors what they can do to support our work. And we want to support you all as well. We posted our Black Women Disrupt survey in Portuguese, Spanish, and English, so we can learn more about the organizations and initiatives that are a part of this community and how we can better serve this growing multilingual uh, group of amazing women. Please find the link in the chat below. I'm so low energy today. What's up? Ugh. Uh, it's been a long week, you guys, and a very tragic and difficult week, too. It hasn't been very easy. Um, as usual, though, I want to remind everyone that we have four things we'd like you to do. Number one, buy from Black women-owned businesses. Number two, fund Black women-led organizations. And number three, pay Black women equally for their labor. Uh, last but not least, invest in our visions and our communities. We'll leave our link to all of our new stuff and all the ways that you can get involved with us in the link below. Um, but I don't have anything else to say. I wanna to talk to the person who's waiting behind the scenes. I'm missing her. I want to see her. I'm ready to chat. Are you guys ready? Let's get into it. So Coqueta Muerte is here with us. There she is. So. So good to see you, sis. So good to see you. Um, see how you are too. you? Yeah, man. I'm okay. It's been really a, such an up and down period, right? One moment it feels like things are okay, but you know constantly that nothing is okay. Yeah. No, nothing is okay and nothing is the way it was. And um, I just, before we get into our chat, Coquette, so I have to let the people know who they're speaking with because... Uh, this is no short feat. Coqueta Muerte, uh, we're just delighted to have her here because yes, she's a friend, but she also has a long background in civ uh, civic activism, has over the years worked at the intersection of governance, communication, and citizen action. In 2019, she was announced as an uh, Atlantic Fellow for Racial Equity, but Coqueta was also an inaugural Obama Foundation Fellow and an Aspen Institute New Voices Senior Fellow. She serves as a reference uh, group member of the Civic Tech Innovation Network and is the deputy chairperson of the SOS Coalition, a coalition of South African organizations committed to and campaigning for public broadcasting and the public interest. When she's not at work, which is almost never, so we're so lucky to have her here with us today, Coquetso can be found writing and has been published by City Press, Al Jazeera, the Guardian, Africa as a Country, Salon, and The Mail and Guardian, among others. She's um, on social media. You'll see her often making very uh, poignant interventions and uh, critiquing the systems in which we are living under. And I love it. I love her voice. I love being uh, in this friendship with her. I enjoy having intellectual conversations with her. And so today we're going to get a little silly. <laughs> Not really. We have so much to talk about. Um, thank you so much, Coquetso, for joining us. Um, how are you doing? How are we doing in South Africa? What is happening? Tell us. Yeah, uh, South Africa is, I mean, this pandemic comes in a country which is one of the most unequal in the world, right? So I don't have to tell you how devastating the consequences are and how amplified the inequalities are and the risk which has actually happened that we are further deepening these inequalities and further reinventing them. I think for me personally, one of the things that has been going on, it's quite up and down, right? You think mm -hmm. you're okay, but one of the things that has quite struck me about this time is just that um, it has been a consistent period of decision-making and mm. making big decisions, both personally, you know, whether it's a simple thing about whether my kids are going back to school or not, or organizationally, right? Like, how are we handling that? And so I'm just in this period of decision making. And so it gives, it flows. But yeah, the people in my space are amazing. 
the Black women, the intergenerational space I occupy is yes. just thriving with support. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, you know, we have to ask our, each other those questions because it used to be we would just kind of pass by one another and in greeting just because it's what we, we normally do. We say, hey, how you doing? And we don't wait for the answer. But I think what we've learned and what we're learning is that hearing that answer is part of helping us cope with what we're feeling too. We need to hear how people are doing, whether it's good or bad, it puts things into perspective for us. And so I, I'm hoping that all is pretty much well, but we know that outside our doors all day long, things are happening around us that aren't so great. Um, that said, I'm gonna pivot a bit and I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Are you game for some questions? From you? <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm not gonna throw you under no buses. We're not gonna have <laughs> secret questions, no gotcha moments. We'll be fine. But I want to get this story because you know we've been in conversation over the past year and and more um, about you know we know a little bit and a lot about each other in different ways. But sometimes there's questions I wanted to ask that I just had never just thought of asking. So here we go. We're gonna ask a couple of things. When and how did you know you were a social entrepreneur? Do you know that you're a social entrepreneur? No, I don't. Um, I think of all the, you know, I'm so unattached to titles. But on the other hand, when I think of myself, I think of myself as a fixer, right? Mm -hmm. If something needs to be done and I am there to do it, I'm happy to do it, right? So uh -huh. it doesn't matter how big or small, as long as it is in line with the value that I hold about the world and the vision I have for the world, you know, a much more just world, a world yeah. that centers, you know, black people, black women, low income black women, low yeah. income non binary people, you know, I am yeah. in the game, you know. And awesome. if we are not enforcing the very same structures of which we are opposed to, you know. I am completely anti-racism. I'm completely anti-capitalism. I am completely, you know, I have a very clear ideological line. And so I think I consider myself, if it can be done and I'm there to do it, I will. Mm. And I'm happy to, yeah. Awesome. So what has been your proudest moment on this journey? And whether you want to call yourself a, a civic activist or whether you want to call yourself a social entrepreneur, you are a problem solver, and I've seen that in action. What's been your proudest achievement on this journey? I think, um, you know, there are so many moments that I take a lot of pride in. And I think one of the spaces in which I am most proud of is that I occupy a space in which I get to be so much in the fullness of who I am and mm -hmm. so much in which doesn't conflict with the values that I hold. And I think mm -hmm. to express these values really because of the community that holds me. I don't occupy this place because I come from nowhere, right? I stand mm -hmm. on the shoulders of so many giants, but over and above that, I exist in a space of intergenerational Black feminists yes. who will hold account they will be the first to tell me that okay so i think this is not where you're going okay this is they will tell me the truth about everything i am when i think of sick of having tacky scavenger you know so many wonderful people at whose feet i consistently get to sit at and complain and talk about what's going on and they will yeah. hold me but not only will they hold me but they will also hold me accountable they hold you accountable. And do you also have people you do that for as well? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's this weird thing about how do you try to be, how do you try to be the person others were for you, right? And awesome. I think the man like itself, we've tried to do that with the launch of our fellowship program. We know mm -hmm. how hard it is to be a black woman non-binary leader in this country from a low income community as I myself as have experienced. And I think I try to, you know, within the organization, we try to 
you know, set a program that provides a political education, the campaigning experience, the tech knowledge and all of those things. Um, yes. to people to that level. But I think at a personal level, um, all of one of the things I remember, all of the amazing opportunities I have gotten when nobody thought I was of any value and nobody even saw me, nobody thought I existed. Mm -hmm. There were these people who were willing and able to recognize me, able to see me, able mm -hmm. to see values, you know? And yeah. I the fact that I am able to be the same to others, merely, not even by time, just really modeling what I've yes. been able to have to experience. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. And so in this journey, and, and of course you're in contact with women on a regular basis, uh, women who work with you, who work in community, who work in partnerships with you, you're seeing things that some people don't notice on a regular basis. But I wanted to know from your perspective, what are some of the challenges that sister disruptors facing in South Africa at this time? And I want you to think beyond what you see written in front of you, because when we think about social entrepreneurship, when we think about people being creatives, I think the, of the problem solvers also being in this space. We are innovators in our own space. And I know is, innovation also sounds like a title or an inter, innovator sounds like a title, but as you are solving problems using new forms and new ways of thinking, what are you seeing are some of the challenges facing the sisters who are pushing up against the status quo, pushing up against the way things have always been done in South Africa? So I think, um, you know, it's a very, you know, I love the point that you just made, right? That it's not just about the social entrepreneurs or the creators and none of these things are titled or boss because we often conflate things, right? Mm -hmm. We often conflate innovation with invention, the idea that this is new. But mm -hmm. when we innovate, it's actually the ability to see what exists mm -hmm. and be different with it, right? Mm -hmm. We're actually not creating anything new. We're building on what has been, right? Yeah. And I think I occupy a I think I occupy a particular space in which I am so grateful for the people who have built the foundation on which I stand. On the other hand, in terms of the challenges, I think some of them are quite new. Um, you know, whether we're talking about surveillance, disinformation, and computational propaganda, and how it is used against Black women online, whether Black journalists, whatever sector you are holding, you know, yeah. these are quite new challenges and so the people on whose backs we stand have not quite left us a lifeline for those kind of challenges right really, same old existing challenges right um the undermining the deliberate undermining but i would argue that these are not that different right these are on the same spectrum the consistent mm. undermining of black women's leadership right mm -hmm. is in terms of computational propaganda for as long as we haven't dealt with it in its root cause, right? Um, we can take it at the next level, whether we talk about Donald Trump and um, Cambridge Analytica, right? Right. We can that they cast all of these diffusive messagings and all of that, but mm -hmm. the reality is that racism, um, misogyny, and all of these other inequalities and deep injustices will not go away when we take away the tech, right? The tech only amplifies those very same existing things. And so I think it is the very same spectrum. And yeah, these things continue to exist. In some ways, they manifest in the same ways as they have in the past. Mm -hmm. But again, that past continues to grow for as long as the injustice exists. But we cannot ignore the fact that our forebears, our foremothers have lived us this far. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you say all of that because one line that has kind of a thread that has woven through this entire series has been around how people see innovation. That's actually was my second question, but how people see innovation. And so many 
people who are not our guests believe that innovation means if I'm not on a computer, then I'm not innovating. If I'm not, if I don't have a tech solution, I'm not an innovator. But almost every single sister has cited their ancestors as the inspiration for what is innovation in them. Be, you know, from every corner of the world, they're all saying the same thing. That what I learned from my grandmother, what I learned from my aunties, what I learned from my community has shaped how I think about solving problems. And this is what creates my iteration process. This is what allows me to invent and reinvent. It's not an invention. It is drawing from knowledge that already exists and being able to map a constellation that already is a part of who we are. We just have to tap into it. So I don't know if that's what you were saying, but that's what I heard. <laughs> not completely, but there's something there. And I want, I, I definitely want to play around with it as I ask you what role innovation plays in your work. So for people who don't know what Aman Lamobi does, I would love for you to explain it from your point of view and talk about what innovation means in that space. Um, so Amanda Lamobi, we are a community of over 600,000 people working to turn every cell phone into a democracy building tool mm -hmm. and we do this so that those most affected by injustice, um, which is low income black women, can take action on issues affecting their lives. And mm -hmm. we operate in a multilingual way, in an accessible way. And I think innovation in that sense was that we did not have to build new tech, right? South Africa is a country of many divisions. South Africa is a country of, you know, whether we're talking about the racial inequality, whether we talk about the gendered nature, the class, you know, all yeah. of these things. We are a country that is one of the most unequal in the world. But one of the things we most have in common is the mm -hmm. ability to access a cell phone. And so for us, it was quite a deliberate choice to be like on mobile channels. It's not just a digital channel. It is yeah. about the USD, which is a short code, you know, like the Star 100 hatch. Mm -hmm. um, we would be on WhatsApp. We would be on Mixit, which was at the time. But we would be available on mobile channels to okay. connect people in ways that build people power, right? So whether you're a small community of 1,500 people and you mm -hmm. feel like you're being ignored, you can engage with others beyond the small world in which you live, right? And mm -hmm. build that people power that is absolutely necessary to make the change in what you want to see in the world. Absolutely. And expanding on that model, because now you're talking about community smaller communities, communities that we normally think of when we think of what are my needs, uh, my, my immediate needs. How do you see that work expanding globally? And what is, do you think there's validity and value in expanding your work globally? Absolutely. So I'm quite clear. You know, one of the things um, we often see in the world is that whether you're an organization or an individual, right? I think uh -huh. a lot of times change makers are incentivized to think of themselves as being at the center of the world. I am the important person. My right. yeah, I go. organization, right? Right. The reality right. Is on the periphery. We are fighting governments, um, systems, global powers that have so much more resources, that have so much more capacity than what we do. But I think as history has shown us over and over again, what brings us closer to the center to make the change that needs to be made is by working collectively, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's continuous thinking about how do we connect all these dots? How do mm -hmm. we connect all these people, how do we connect all these communities that may be fighting the same battle but don't even know it, that yeah. may be fighting the same battle but don't even know that the other exists, right? And it is treated like an other, and therefore we actually actively ignore that it exists. So for me, it's like, how do we build that capacity beyond my small community, beyond me and my friends, and also recognizing that those are important. Me as yes. the individual, yeah. I do get this collective, right? Mm -hmm. Me and my friends, we can get to this collective, but that yeah. builds a community. And mm -hmm. how do we spend it in the many ways we can see? And this is necessary. I think as a Mandla, we're quite clear, right? 
Just yeah. as one example, we do a lot of work around tax justice. Mm-hmm. And we are yeah, we're not going to fight tax justice in South Africa. The companies and the corporates we're going against, they mm-hmm. hit the ground even in South Africa, right? We need that global community to take yes. that even further, right? I can yes. escalate a whole set of issues, whether we're talking about white supremacy, whether we're talking about capitalism, you know, like all of these systems, the patriarchy, patriarchal violence, as yeah. um, Black Future would say, right? These mm-hmm. are all global systems. Yeah, yeah. they are. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It is the reason, too, why we seek community at a on a global scale as well with Black Women Disrupt. There's something beautiful about realizing that the th- the challenge the challenges we're facing are not the challenges that only happen to us where we are. Um, back in October, we brought a group of sister disruptors together from Brazil and from the U.S. And you know the folks who are here from Atlanta and the folks who are from different cities around Brazil. At the end, we're almost in tears because you believe that maybe somewhere else things are so so drastically different, you know. But you recognize that these same challenges are existing for Black women who are in business, for Black women who are attempting to organize themselves, for Black women who are attempting to find resources, that we are facing similar challenges. And what would the world look like if we could actually have real communication, not, I wanna say an authentic communication because very often we're put in a room and we just have to be in a Zoom call or Mm -hmm. we're put in a room and we kind of all look at each other's name tags. But what if we could actually have partnership, dialogue, and build solidarity in a way that we didn't imagine before. And especially when we're talking about economic power, it, 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 I don't know very many places where that happens. And, and I wanna see it more organically happen. We shall so see. So it's an interesting thing that you're talking about because I would actually describe it as principal struggle, right? Just cause we are black women in the same space doesn't even need to, doesn't even mean that our needs will be the same right no. and so how do we find each other right with these different ideologies that become yes. black women are these homogenous groups yes, yes, yes. Each other with these different interests these different manifestations of these problems we're talking about and exactly. how do we engage in a principal struggle and a principal struggle means that how do we find ourselves operating within the values that we hold and the mm-hmm. shared values that we are all clear on? Because as always, clarity is kindness, right? <laughs> How do we engage in the principal struggle and push forward what we understand to be our shared struggle? Mm-hmm. Not because I can benefit more from you because of the part of the world I can come, I come from, not yeah. because I can help to you because of the part of the world I can come from, you know, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. How is it a robust principle struggle where we can disagree and actually be in conflict with each other to find still, that, yes. that holds us together, right? And yes. so for me, that is the space of principle struggle. And very often, I think this neoliberal logic in which we live, which incentivizes people looking at the self, the mm-hmm. individual, the mm-hmm. choice the individual makes in relation to you know, the country I come from and all these other barriers, Mm. this is something we obviously have to struggle against, right? And we are seeing it in this era of COVID-19 actually being incentivized even much more. That incentivized is being accelerated at a scale that is deeply, deeply horrifying. It's troubling. Um, And there's just so little space now, not now in this now, but with the advent of different social media and the ways that we communicate with one another, there seems to be fewer spaces where you can have the type of debate you really want to have. I would love to just like put some people in a room together and see what happens. <laughs> okay, maybe I don't. <laughs> put some people in a room together <laughs> so that we can actually hear out the full thought. I get disgusted a bit by the 120 character debate, you know, here we go, I'm so right. And then the other person, you're so wrong. And at some point we haven't delved any deeper. We've just exchanged blows. We haven't, how have we built? 
And that is something I'm very interested in, in learning better ways for us to do. I, I just think we need more space. And I don't know how we carve that space out, especially since, as you mentioned, resources are not always available for us to do things the way that others get to do them. Um, we have to be very creative. So I've been using, and we've been using this platform, but it's still not adequate. I'd love to see how we can do even more to be able to create spaces that are meaningful for dialogue and then co-creation, building and other things. So I think creativity lies in the fact that you understand the limitations of a platform, that here's a platform that has a 120 character limit, what is the most I can do with it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is how we think about space is what's crucial, right? We're not gonna expand spaces for face-to-face -face time building. That requires yeah. travel, that requires passports, that requires <laughs> a whole set of things that are not they accessible. Often are not accessible. Right? Yes. So yeah. how do we create spaces with what we have now? And I think mm -hmm. this is the key thing in which we are always working with, how yeah. do we meet people who they are, right? And how mm -hmm. do we make the best use of it? Um, yeah. Whether you want SMS or text messaging, in what ways can we use text messaging to build relationships in ways that actually we won't be able to build, merely because I live in a community that has no public transport, right? It's not close to the, given South Africa's birth date geography, and we can extend it to colonial times, but yeah. I'm actually not going to see everybody, right? Mm -hmm. I will not be in a space. And had I not been afforded the opportunities that I've been given, I probably would have not met you as well, you know? Mm -hmm. But in that space, let's say we had come across each other with those 120 characters. What yeah. are the ways in which we can use it to meaningfully engage and build relationship that is not dependent on that platform, mm -hmm. but is dependent on our connection, right? So it's yeah. not how we meet that actually matters. It is mm -hmm. what we do with our coming together. So I think we need to expand on our understandings of space, what yeah. space is, and yeah. what space could be, right? I think Absolutely. that's the really work right there. I hear that. And then I, I have so many questions. <laughs> I have questions that are pre-questions, but I have another question now thinking about what you just said. You talked about the organizing happening in South Africa with Amanda Mobi and in the communities where you are working and with the communities where you live. Being multilingual, how have you overcome that challenge of people speaking different languages? How do we actually build, I wouldn't even call it consensus. How do we build a similar agenda, an alignment of agendas when we have different worldviews perhaps or perspectives because of the way that our language develops? It, it's, our languages are different. They help us think differently. There's nothing wrong with that. How do you, how did you, and how do you do that? You're so, like, <laughs> no, actually, it's still not. So, there's a big bus station um, in Johannesburg. It's called Park Station. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of international buses would come and meet there. And where I come from, which is quite far from, not quite, but it's like a three hour, four hour place away from here. That's where yeah. the town takes you to. What's really fascinating for me is that. Um, Black people actually don't need to speak the same language to understand each other. So my very first experience of coming to Johannesburg, right? Mm -hmm. I did not, like, I come from a place that was formerly then a uh, Bantu span, right? Which mm -hmm. means people were segregated into the homeland system of apartheid, which means yeah. that only people of a particular language could live there. And so mm -hmm. there's certain languages which are very much a part of me as I am of them. They are black languages that I had never heard before until mm -hmm. I came to Johannesburg. What was mm -hmm. fascinating for me at Park Station was everybody, because you just didn't understand the other person's language, you just kept speaking your own language. <laughs> <laughs> you, found a way, you found a way to get to where you were going to be yeah. helped by someone else, you know? Like, yeah. you find a way. And I think yeah. this, in my experience, whether I went to Brazil, 
I don't speak Portuguese like at all. And it was yeah. very interesting for me when I was with my comrades, right? Even mm -hmm. with my, because um, I wasn't always connected to Wi-Fi, even though yeah. I had loaded the Google Translate um, app. But By the way, that thing doesn't really work. <laughs> that, even apart from that, and even with that, right? Mm -hmm. When I knew who my comrades are, I yeah. kind of got to understand what people were describing just by virtue of mm -hmm. how they were speaking, what they were speaking, you pick up the words because you're listening intensely, right? Mm -hmm. And I think part of the inspiration is Prof. Ntebeza um, here in South Africa. I remember he speaks and writes about how he held a conference. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was in 2013, he talks about how Black people always in South Africa at least have to change their language and speak English to be able to understand each other. Mm. And also over and above that, but black people understand each other, but to accommodate white people who are participants, mm. English is the language of choice, even if all the black people would understand each other. And he held a conference. The conference mm. was everyone speak your own language, but there was no translation available, right? And people found a way to, and those who wanted to understand each other, at least, found a way yeah. to understand each other. And I find it to be such an exciting thing because, likewise, that's what we find. I mean, even if we had to come together, because I remember when we were painting data as four banners, you know, I don't speak with Zulu, I don't speak with Sikosa, yeah. um, I understand Sikpedi, and I speak Sisoto, but. It's not only, like it's only five languages, right? Right. <laughs> I didn't have to come in speaking this. We found a way to connect, right? And yeah. this is what humanity is about. Mm -hmm. We want to connect through world. Yeah. yeah. But the neoliberal capitalistic logic tells you that you must only connect where there is an incentive or you will be reimbursed for your connection, right? And that's mm. what we want I love that. I love that and because that is a very different way of thinking, but it also is a way that I feel like many of us who have uh, been Black, <laughs> are Black, remain Black, but have been in global spaces, that is the experience that you almost get to be every person. Because I'm sure when you arrived in Brazil, people didn't automatically go, oh, there's the South African lady you look like people I know in Brazil. Like I have two people right now today that I'd be like, Koketsu, you should meet your cousin because they live in Rio and they look just like you. <laughs> and I keep, I'm, I'm always amazed by when I'm in another country, how people assume I know the schedule of the bus. People stop, they ask me what time it is. Then they say, do you know, what do you know when the bus passes here? And I'm like, how do people even believe that I'm from here. But can't you see that I'm not from here? But there is something in our body language, something in the way that we smile or the way that we're, something is transmitting to other people that I belong here to. Shared and you, humanity. Shared humanity, absolutely. Um, so I actually have a, a pivot question to ask you and it's, it's a little bit more personal, not too personal. You told me you work a lot. I know you work a lot. We work many hours, we're working around the clock. There's so many things that one has to, has to manage. As a person who is organizing, as a person who is leading a, a set of, of, of movements and activities during the day, um, as a person who is also taking care of others in their home, at least that's my reality is I have two little people that I take care of and my parents live just nearby as well. And with all of the things that pull on you during the day, what centers you? What do you draw on that gives you balance? So I'm gonna It's not a religious it. question. It's not a religious question. You answer how yeah. you feel like you answer. Okay. But I'm gonna answer it in a long-winded way. So okay. many years ago, I think um, I come from a space of I believe in anger, right? And I mm. think continuously what I have found is that 
my anger drives me. You know, when I'm angry, I act. Yeah. What's been really fascinating for me, particularly when I was younger, was I had someone who, you know, a lot of people who actually showed me love and I didn't realize they were showing me love. Mm. And somebody was like, but why doesn't love drive you as much, you know? That are, and it's just like, love, that newfie, newfie feeling. What the hell is that? Like, I'm not here to express some kind of a, like, weird emotion. But it's interesting how anger driven by a deep love hmm. just helps people feel so much. And hmm. in the same way that I think I've been able to connect my feelings of, anger my feelings of so many things which are very legitimate to love mm -hmm. i've been able to see how even where things ended badly at almost every point in my life i'm one of the lucky people who's experienced deep love mm -hmm. i am one of the people who i can look back and say that what does love look like this was love in action this is how it manifested in my life this is how it showed up this is how i was supported you know just wow. likewise in this period, you know? And yeah. I think it's set an example for me about deep love will awaken. It's a call to action, right? It's not this like weird passive feeling. It's a mm. call to action. It's a call to if you see something that is not right, that is happening, you need to do something. Mm. It's a ability to be held accountable and see that you holding me accountable is not you dissing me. It's actually mm. like, Mm. Your love is trying to raise me higher and raise the bar for me, you know? Absolutely. And, and I think that's what cinches me. I I am so held by the knowledge that I am so loved. I am Aww. deeply loved. And I love others deeply, whether it is my children, my grandmother, my wider community, because it's a weird one, because people will say I'm a single mother. Mm. The values and what these children are are not only up to me. Our community has helped me raise these children, right? Yeah. Whether, in, you know, I can describe them many little ways. But the ultimate thing that holds me together is this, this love, mm -hmm. this love that I have borne so much witness to and I have carried so much of that actually I have no reason to check out because it exists. Mm -hmm. It gives me the fuel I need, but it also gives me the anger I need. It feeds everything. Even when I am tired, the last week, the last two weeks, the last mm -hmm. two months mm -hmm. of my life has been so damn exhausting. And yeah. the only reason I've been able to keep it together yeah. is oh. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I know, you know, I said I wasn't going to ask any personal questions, but it's a part of who we are. Like, how do you get the fuel to do what you get to do to be able to be effective in all these other spaces? I think that's just very helpful for many of us. Some of us can't even express it in that way, but yeah. As the feminists have always said, the personal is the political, right? I don't oh, yeah. actually in a way at work because it's a divorce from my personal coquetto. It's yeah. like these two things have to intertwine. And it's yeah. a difficult thing about when stuff goes wrong at work, mm -hmm. when stuff goes wrong personally, mm -hmm. I have to handle it in this is the love, this yeah. is the quality, yeah. this is the entirety of me I bring to the space, right? And it's mm -hmm. not always pleasant, it's not always easy. And that's why the comrades who love you are so important because they will tell you when you are the itchiest, my comrade. They'll feel like, <laughs> you need to go home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what were you doing there? Like, yeah. <laughs> All the black feminists, I'm just like, always like, okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is good, though. That's good to know. During this time, I'm very curious about how your work had to shift or has shifted because we're in this cycle of what's happening to us right now. I mean, everything is so intense. In this country, it's <laughs> it's very intense. Um, I'm sure South Africa is not much different in terms of the intensity of what people are feeling during both the COVID pandemic, but then in the existing inequities, in the existing 
challenges that already were there. How are you all adapting or pivoting in this time with the work that you do? How has it changed? How has it remained the same? Um, so I think in many ways, at the heart of it, it actually hasn't changed. It's the expression of it possibly that has changed, right? Because mm -hmm. South Africa was unequal before this. Um, South Africa, unless things are done now, will become even more unequal after this, right? And yeah. so like, how do you both fill the gap but not get focused on the present only, but use the present as a gateway towards changing the future as well, right? Because there's also the risk that you get so stuck on the immediate relief, right? Yeah. That you lose sight of the deep systemic injustice. And I yeah. think those two things have to happen in combination of each other. And this is the thing I like about thinking of changes in ecosystem. I think I'm quite... Um, I have no illusions. It's not like mm. low-income women are not acting if a manga's not there, if I'm not there, right? People mm. are acting. We just, yeah. we support what people are actually doing. And yeah. that's gonna change. And I think we have to be humble about that. No institution, organization, or movement, or whatever people build is gonna change everything for everybody, right? And mm. it's like, mm. how do we connect and build these ecosystems? How do we, as a mandala that tries to mobilize people in a particular way, support the people who are the researchers, who are the yeah. artists, who yeah. are the, you know, all of the people who are change makers in their own ways? But how are we working towards this goal of liberation and this goal of upending this inequality that exists, this deep injustice in which yeah. we all exist, right? So yeah. I think that that's it for me, right? We, uh -huh. it, it's just, I think there needs to be this deep humility that I am no it girl. A man that I'm not no it organization. And these moments- That's what you say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's very, very true, right? And I think this is the thing, even me without a manza, right? Yeah. I would continue to organize. There's no yes, single person that yeah, would. is quieter. And so it just becomes this thing about like, I think we need the humility, but we mm -hmm. also need to recognize what we are capable of. That actually mm -hmm. we do have these things. We have the Alliance for Rural Development that is run by Constance Mukhale. We have, yes, we have all of these things at our disposal. How do we put them together? and build yeah. the world in which we to see. It's about the vision at the end of the day. How we get there, is it principled? Is it a principled struggle? It's not mm -hmm. an end or means where we sacrifice the means, we sacrifice each other to get to the end, right? It's yeah. how do we collectively build? How do we connect? That's, that's it at the end of the day, to build the power we need to get there. Love it. And are we ready, right? As Charlene Carruthers writes, Oh, you said, are we ready? ready? Yes, 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 yes. And and honestly, hmm, I think we many of us have had to get ready quickly. Things have changed so fast. Like I think many of us had in our minds, well, I'll float through 2020 and then by 2025, I'll have all of my crap together. I'll be organized the way I can imagine. With my community, I'll be doing these things. I'll be volunteering. I'll be this craziness has actually pushed so many people into doing what I think their life purpose really was. They didn't know that that's what it would be. But when you see folks who are like, you know, I could not imagine families going without food and therefore I just had to do something. I'm like, interesting. Before the same person would be like, I'm, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. That's not necessary, blah, blah, blah. But I'm seeing more and more people dedicating time and energy to a collective benefit um, yeah. that didn't, that was not the drive before. That was not the goal before. So, and this has been a consistent thing throughout history, right? Where people mm -hmm. get pushed into. So this is why I kind of like, I have my position about kind of like titles. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be named an activist to be one. Mm -hmm. As long as I have been alive, which to be fair, isn't that long, but nevertheless, it's long. 
Um, I have seen so many people who do not run around calling themselves activists, who right. are not seen to be activists, but right. what they have done so me through my childhood, right? Mm-hmm. They have seen many other children through their childhood. Mm-hmm. And so it's just this thing about when there's a need for something to be done, you know, the idea of the strong black woman, right? Yeah. Of course, you know, the strong black woman had to endure and be strong, was forced into resilience. And there's all of that stuff. We praise resilience, but on the other hand, there's the reality that we laid down people to a point that they had to be that resilient, right? Yes. And so if somebody asks me, like, are you an activist? It's also like, hey, I didn't ask for Aren't this. You? I wasn't <laughs> But in yeah. life circumstances, I was agitated to it. But yeah, by yeah. what I saw for myself, what I saw in my community, what I saw for other people who looked like me, right? And mm-hmm. I imagine it's quite the same for everybody else. It's not like you wake up this morning and you're like, hmm, today I choose to be an activist, you know? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. like shit going on in this world around me. Something needs to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I make it happen right yeah and you realize that that threshold is getting that threshold is becoming lower and lower in terms of where people are pushed to the end I, i'm seeing it around me i'm seeing young people like i don't care if i have to wear a mask i'm going out i need to do what i need to do and and i don't mean that in terms of like taking care of their everyday needs i'm talking about going to um let their voices be heard in protest um, all around our country. And we're seeing that like this idea of just sitting back and seeing how it plays out is not enough for a lot of our young people, not enough even for the middle-aged folks. I won't say who those would be. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to just pretend like things are as they always were. And it's interesting to see how people are moving and adapting to what we're currently living in. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Oh, go ahead. But also building on what existed, right? Because it's not like it's the first time young people have been moved into oh, agitation. No. Oh, it's no. a historic thing. And so there's just this, when the past and the present meet, right? There's it's like muscle memory. Suddenly we then, like, oh, this is what yeah. we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is yeah. why even the intergenerationalness of our struggles is so important, right? There's Absolutely. a lot to be learned from the past. There's a lot to put forward to the future. There's mm-hmm. a lot to reimagine and co-create. And so it's just yeah. this thing about the past and the present coming together and mm-hmm. agitating us all, no matter yeah. our age enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I have one last question out there in the ether. Well, no, I have a couple more, but uh, we wanted to know from your perspective, what can, and this is broad because we know there are many, many groups within each of these groups that we're talking about, but what is something that we can be doing um, to build and strengthen relationships across borders? Um, So Zakia, I don't want to interrupt you, but as luck would have it, I have been very pressed for a while. I just need to run up for two minutes. Okay. <laughs> you better run. I'm going to run. I will be right back. <laughs> I knew it. I knew she was going to do this. <laughs> Look, I'm going to take this five seconds then while our guest is taking a quick break to basically... Um, talk a little bit to you all about the survey. I know I've been doing the church announcements long enough, but today is our last, last um, episode or series or uh, session in this series. And we have been developing a tool to help us better know with whom we're in community with, what talent, what, services, what products, what focus you have in your business and where you guys are coming from. So down in the link, I think the link is passing down at the bottom of the screen. 
um, we have a link to our surveys. The surveys are in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And it would be amazing if you could help us by filling that out for us. Um, take It's less than four minutes. And I promise I'm gonna post a video actually later on today talking about how you do it. Because I know, I hate surveys. I hate to be asked questions and I hate to turn it in on time, but I'm gonna ask you all to do that for us. Our guest is back. You guys ready to hear our last question? It's the best one. We're gonna add it. There she is. <laughs> Just freshening up. <laughs> That's why they call it live because it is real. This is not like fake. I'm just surprised my kids haven't run into the scene yet and like shown their faces behind me. This is not a fake, you know, banner. This is like a piece of cloth I put up so that we can have a back, a background. Um and it's real, life is real. But if you could, this this last question about how we connect. And, you know, I, for me, the concept of borders is, it's something that irks me. It's something that, that for me has always been, um, my goal has always been to not deal with the border and to deal with the people to have actual people to people relationships that aren't about like, you know, what nationality are you? And then how can we get down based on your nationality? I'm really, that is not the vision of Black Women Disrupt, nor is it my personal vision. But in your experience and the things that you've been working on, the experiences you've been having in the past few years, what can we be doing? What should we be doing to strengthen our relationships across this thing called borders? I think it's such a timely question, um, given everything that's going on in the world, right? We've seen this rise of authoritarianism. We've seen this resurgence of this deep, deep xenophobic, anti-migrant sentiment. Many parts of the world in South Africa is not excluded from that. And also we are recognizing the way it manifests, right? Um, so xenophobia here has always particularly targeted Africans, Asians in particular, but there's people from particular countries whom it doesn't target, right? And so yeah. recognizing all of these things is, is so, so crucial. And recognizing mm -hmm. how just power manifests, right? Not only in terms of race, but in terms of the kind of passports one holds, right? Who mm -hmm. gets killed me and whatnot? So I think one of the key things that is so completely essential is recognizing, as many, many people have said throughout history, right? No human is illegal anywhere. As long as you're on this earth, you cannot be illegal, right? And <laughs> I think that is something we need to commit to and recommit to, even in this depth of inequality in which we exist in where we are yeah. all looking for resources, where, you know, the lowest of the low amongst us are, com are consistently being forced into competition with each other. And mm -hmm. with the recognition, once we do that, that no human is illegal anyway, we come to recognize borders for what they are. Borders are a matter of control, right? Controlling mm -hmm. human movement, controlling who sees who as human, controlling mm -hmm. who others and is able to other who as what, well, right? Which yeah. explains to the passports, what the visa process looks like. Like it manifests yeah. at so it's many different process. levels. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is how, as we um, see that um, the neoliberal logic, right, has caught us into where we are able to oppose certain injustices domestically but not recognize how we impose those injustices externally, right? Because yeah. we are so held by those borders. And I think mm -hmm. there's an opportunity, this is the one big thing about transnationalism that it mm -hmm. offers us. It gives us an opportunity to understand and see that the struggle I as Coquetso face here, where I was raised and born, where I was born and raised, and the city in which I have now come to, how they translate to the somebody who would be considered other coming mm -hmm. to come here, right? How they connect beyond in all these ways. So my struggle is not disconnected to other struggles. And I think mm -hmm. that's what 
transnationalism offers. It offers the opportunity that, hey, forget it. I don't have to learn. You don't have to learn all these lessons on your own. Actually, if you want to think about a lesson on what is abolitionist feminism, think about X, Y, Z. You know, feminism right. as a whole is abolitionist inherently, right? But mm-hmm. when there were when people coined up this term, what were they thinking of? And thinking mm-hmm. of it beyond my own confines. But thinking about it in relation to how my own confines have replicated this very same thing, right? And yeah, I think yeah. that is so exciting. I mean, it's one of the things that most excites me about meeting and being with um, Black feminists from Uganda to Kenya to Zimbabwe, right. to the US to Brazil, meeting indigenous women and, you know, like being like my feminist comrades in India. It's that's the most exciting thing that you recognize that the world is so much bigger than yeah. your small part of it, but yeah. your small part also has something to play in this whole big world. And these things aren't separate. And just to escalate it a little bit, this is my problem with how we speak about inequality, right? Mm. Very often we talk about inequality as something that just exists. You know, mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. person is going to be the brunt of inequality and all of that. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, what we often don't get focused to is that there are people who benefit and deliberately uphold inequality, right? So it's not a system versus individual thing. It's that mm-hmm. there are individuals who create an system, right? And yes. systems are... So these things, you can't actually separate them. It's a very false separation. These mm-hmm. things have to be, yeah, yeah, just the recognition that, yeah, systems are made up of the individual parts, just yeah. as much as individual parts can break down those very same systems. And so what do I, Kogeto, where I'm searching in South Africa, have to offer the world? Mm. But also, in what ways can I connect with the world that it recognizes that in South Africa, and here's for Keto, I can show you that, hey, actually, the tech companies that are based in your country, this is what they're doing in my country. How do mm-hmm. we work together to mm-hmm. avoid the colonialism that we see going on? How do we talk about um, racial inequality in the U.S. recognizing what the U.S. military bases do in the rest of the world? Is the very same thing that you're replicating there in your own cities, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that, yeah, absolutely. That is the beauty of that transnational solidarity, of imagining yourself in the shoes of another person in a different place, but having having a, a bigger vision because you're in relationship with that other person, being able to track the trends that are affecting all of us. Sometimes you feel like it's just happening to you. This is just happening in my neighborhood. They sell the eggs at this price or you know, we never have access to banking and this this must just be my problem, my thing to to shoulder, my thing to bear. And I think this idea of traversing boundaries and being able to talk frankly and authentically with other people in real conversation and real dialogue and real exchange allows a person to also see where they are in the world and how these things are actually replicated all over the world. We just believe that it's just happening to us. When I can see that, I'm like, oh, McDonald's has made people. (laughs) Like, I can see the trend. I know what's getting ready to happen. Like, oh, we got McDonald's. We're so happy. I'm like, "Mm, give it 12 years. And as you see the 12 years passing, you're like, oh, that's what happens when this comes into the community or when this other thing is introduced into the community. Anywho, I'm going on long-winded and I have one very last We have one very last, very beautiful question for you. I want you to get your get yourself right for this one, please, sis. What are you listening to? (laughs) That is not a song. (laughs) No, this is coffee. Right. Okay. (laughs) What are you listening to? What are you reading? And what are you watching? if anything, that is giving you life? That is such an interesting question. 
So, um, mm -hmm. what am I watching? I am watching yeah. you. I'm quite a dull person. Um, so I don't watch anything much. I love movies and documentaries. But right now, um, Encounters, which is a South African documentary festival, is okay. happening. Okay. And it's virtual, free all over the world. But they have some of the world's best documentaries available. Okay. Um, of course, you have to get a ticket because they limit it to 400 people. They have some very good documentaries, okay? Um, we're talking about... How is it um, free for everyone if it's only limited to 400? What are we going to do? 400. 400 tickets of people at a time, so for okay. per screening, but of okay. course there's multiple screenings, because okay. yeah, the problem is, of course, you'd crash if you had too many. Yeah, people. too many, yeah. I mean, yeah, some of the world's best, I'm talking about films about Gaza, from Palestine to South Africa, to the US, to like, I mean, they have all of those documentaries. So, of course, mm -hmm. I am really, like living my best life because that is happening right now. Um, okay. And then the Urban International Film Festival at which Dillon Valley will, yeah. also be, will also be happening shortly in September. So yeah. that I'm looking to do. That's probably I have well. the music. <laughs> okay, and any music that you're liking, any songs that you enjoy? So, um, I am such, I am traditionally such a music snob, eh? okay? Okay, back in the day person, like mm -hmm. give me the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. I'm happy. I haven't listened much to new music. But what was very fascinating for me was when the WAP came out. The oh. fun online alone. Like, <laughs> like, what is going on? And then yesterday, the dangly thing at the back of your throat. Right? That's a vibe right there. <laughs> Let's just say, uh, yeah. So, would that is that your new theme song? Are we are we playing that song? You enjoying it? This, that's beside the point, really. Yes, yes, yes. Um, which is very interesting because it's one of the very few like new age modern songs. But I think mm -hmm. what most attracted me to it, right? Because I wouldn't have ordinarily woken up in the morning and looked it up. It was yes. just you know, the conversations that were happening about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, man, I saw people being like dab, dry ass pee, and you know, all of these things. <laughs> what is going on? Why are you trying to be dry in the midst of the moment? Like, you know, and you're just like curious. And I think there's something that it speaks to about agency, right? Agency and control. Yeah. There are yeah. certain people who only welcome sexuality and the expression of black sexuality. Um, only when it's under their control or only when they can benefit from. And you have just seen it shaken that yeah. actually it can be expressed outside of your control and it doesn't matter. You know, like I just think that was that was really, really awesome. And yeah. young man, I mean, yes. the other day I've been going through like in the workspace, there's been just this has been quite an intense week. Um, yeah. It changes people's underestimation. But what was interesting was one of my conversations. I was just ending it describing what a dangly thing at the back of the throat is. And I seen this, um, I seen one of the TikToks that was made, because we've also seen a lot of creativity globally. I think one of the things that has helped me together has just been like this ability to show and express Black creativity in yeah. such a time way where it crosses all boundaries and mm -hmm. there were memes about the you know when that line comes up and then the dangle thing being like ah! <laughs> <laughs> I crack myself a lot. the video so yeah yeah, yeah. okay well we're gonna add that to our list of songs we must listen to at least once <laughs> And guess what, Coquetso? Do you believe that we got through a whole hour? 
we got through the whole hour. We, oh, wow. we literally, yeah. And I feel much better. I hope you all feel much better out there too. This week has been heavy. This week has been difficult. But, and, and this whole summer really has been quite a challenge for everyone in one way or another. Um, but it's so apropos that you would be my last guest. Dora Marimo was my first guest in June. And so I've sandwiched South Africa on the front end and on the back end, and I feel like I'm okay. I think we're good. I appreciate you for coming. I appreciate you for being here with us. I thank you so much for taking time out of your day. If you have one last thing you'd like to share with our sisters and friends, because some of them are not sisters, but some are friends. <laughs> I think that, um, yeah, it would be a remiss of me as much as I have had a good time um, this evening. Yeah. I cannot ignore the fact that um, in South Africa, the number of deaths that have occurred and mm -hmm. globally as well, you know? Yeah. This is what happens. This is what happens when you do not create and live in a world that sees people as worthy, right? We have countries that are trying to separate the deserving from the undeserving. We have countries that are not making healthcare available to all. We have all of these things going on around us. And I yeah. think very often we get caught up in the cycle of we see something is wrong and you just like, call me to the picket line. And it's actually time for us to ask, what are we doing to create the picket line? Where yeah. are we? Right? What am I going to wake up and do and call people to the picket line? Because the yeah. evidence is overwhelming that what has preceded us, the mm -hmm. normal that existed before this is not something we want to return to because that is what this crisis is amplifying and reinventing right now. How do we not go back to that normal? That is the constant question. We should not be able to sleep at night as people who are still alive right now, people who are not as deeply affected or directly affected in that way. Mm -hmm. Our job is to, what should I be doing right now to change this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So that's the thought I would love to leave with everybody else. Because no matter which country we live in, um, mm -hmm. this is the thing, right? There are certain people who are being more impacted than others, um, whether it's racialized, whether it's gendered, whether it's classist, whether it's ableist. There are just all these ways in which it's currently manifesting. And it's the challenge of our time. And what we bring forth as Roy writes, you know, there's a way to get a portal to a new world. Are we going to claim that new world or will we resign ourselves to the reality that the old world may come, knowing very well that some people who face the struggle right now yeah. may just be content with it and actually want to return to the old world? Yeah, that's my happy thought. You did it, you did that. And I appreciate you for accompanying us here on this last session. That is the best thought. It's what I've been thinking of the entire series. It's what we've been reflecting on here the entire series. What are we going to do with this time? And how do we, how do we, how do we adjust to it? How do we move in it? How do we make sure that those that we know that we love are taken care of? And it's, it's an amazing, amazing time. It can be both challenging, but also liberating. And I'm gonna leave it there because there are some things, some, some of us are, are, are experiencing a different sense of freedom in this moment too. Um, we're experiencing a lot of stress, but also a lot of freedom. Sisters and friends, did you like what you heard today? I sure did. I enjoyed visiting with my friend Koketsu Moetsi and hearing about her work and about her perspectives on life and what we're doing in this moment. I think we've got a lot more to do and I'm sad that today is our last day in the series, but this was called Summer Series Live and we are at the end of August. It is no longer, August, it's no longer summer. We have to resign ourselves to the fact that the next season is coming and 
we know we're going to pop up live a couple of more times before the end of this year happens. We've got some very good things in the works. Please stay tuned. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow our special guest and her organization, please. Um, you can learn a lot about the experiences that they're having in South Africa. I think there are so many things that we can be exchanging. Um, and don't forget to follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, at Black Women Disrupt. On Twitter, we are Black W Disrupt. Don't ask. Um, also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every single session that we've had will be there, stored on uh, and available to you on the replay. And we'd love to hear your thoughts about what you learned, about what you experienced while listening to Sister Disruptors share with us some of the lessons they've learned in their own lives. Um, as always, sisters, don't forget to give a shout out, post a picture, send some love to a sister disruptor you admire and respect. I try to do that every day, please. We love it. It makes you feel good to know that people are actually hearing what you're saying. Um, tell your friends and don't forget to hashtag Black Women Disrupt because we want to send her some love too. We believe that if we can support one another, we can do a lot more good in the world. Stay safe. But before I end, this is my last sentence, but you all will notice behind me. Thank you, Oaktown Brown. Um, I know who that is. I think I know who that is. Behind me, you will see this beautiful cloth. And this was a gift from a sister named Ellie in Angola uh, from Luanda. And I couldn't help but put it up behind me today because I was just reflecting on how beautiful we can be as sisters, how incredibly supportive we can be and how people can make you feel like you're on the right road, you're on the right path. So let's be supportive of one another. Let's stay safe, you guys, and stay home if you can. If you cannot stay home, help one another to be able to get the things that you need to get and um, stay connected. Love you, Coquetso, even from afar. Thank, Thank you so much. Me. Take care, sister. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you soon. Oh, Oaktown Brown says, many thanks to us both. Wonderful inspiration. I know who it is. Do you know who it is, Coquetso? Cedric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll meet again soon. Take care, sis. And I will be reaching out just to have a chat. Maybe a little mug. <laughs> Talk to you guys later. <laughs> be good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.